Today's video is going to be a Q&A where I'm answering questions that you guys have sent in about raising teens, homeschooling, home and garden, and more. Welcome back to my Practically Imperfect Life. As I mentioned in the intro, today is going to be a Q&A video. I had posted up on Instagram and on YouTube a couple of weeks ago asking you guys to submit questions you had about teens and home life and gardening and homeschooling, and you guys did not disappoint. I have a list, I typed them all up, and I'm gonna try to get to as many as I can. I think I'm gonna try to keep this video to under 30 minutes if possible. So if I don't get through all of them, I will save them and try to get them when I do the next round of questions. So I'm just gonna jump into this list. They're in no particular order. I just copied them on to here in the order that I saw them posted. And first one up says, I would like to learn how you can and freeze or preserve vegetables from the garden. I will definitely be doing some videos specifically on this as we get more into that season. But in general, I do have a water bath canner, just the old school water bath canner. I do use that probably more than anything else. And I look for different recipes or different instructions on how to safely can things. The Ball Mason Jar brand, they have tons tons of information on their website. You can put in almost any fruit and vegetable and it will tell you how you can safely can that product. Now there are certain things that are recommended to be pressure canned and so the difference with that is that you have a basically looks like a stock pot that will work sort of like a pressure cooker and it will form a certain amount of pressure in there. You have to let it go for a certain amount of time. That's for example, how you do green beans. So green beans aren't really safe to water or bath can. You have to pressure can them. And then I do cut and store a lot of things in the freezer that either I don't want to can or I, I don't like how they taste when they're canned. So that might be like potatoes, for example. Instead, I might dice up potatoes or pre-cut french fries and freeze those. I do a lot of freezing of things like carrots and broccoli and cauliflower that we can then later take out and steam or cook or put in a casserole. Those are the big ways that I do preserving, but I will have lots of videos coming out as we go kind of into the tail end of summer and into the fall because we will have lots of produce coming out of our garden that we will be canning and preserving. I also got a dehydrator this year for Christmas. And so I'm looking forward to being able to do like dehydrated fruits, like uh, dried apple slices, dried orange slices. My kids want me to make beef jerky, which I've never made. So that could be a fun experiment to do. But I do a combination of things just based on what ways we use stuff and what I have storage space wise. The next question is on cell phones. It says phone balance during the day. Uh, hard to know if they are doing schoolwork, listening to audiobooks, or just texting friends during the day. I don't want to be a nag by asking all the time, but I want them to also make sure they are engaged in schoolwork. So I believe what you're looking for is kind of how do I control the phone thing. Now, both of my kids do have cell phones. We use exclusively Apple products. So we have Mac MacBooks, I have a Mac desktop, and then my kids and I, we all have iPhones. And one of the cool features on the iPhone is that I have screen time controls and I'll try to show like a little um, video here kind of showing my phone. But basically for each of my kids, I can set a lot of different parameters. First of all, I can set what's called downtime. So that's a particular time of day where certain things on their phone are going to shut off and not be accessible by then. I will adjust that based on the day of the week and also the time of year we're in. During the school year, a lot of their apps will be locked until the usual end of our school day. So that might be early afternoon, one, two o'clock. Whereas during the summer, it might only be set for downtime from 10 p.m. till 8 a.m. for example. I can also go in there and I can choose which apps they can use all the time. They can use like their Bible app all the time. They can use Audible all the time. I do uh, let them use uh, like Firefox, which is what we watch like our YouTube videos on and do a lot of our, our online reading. But I can also set time limits for different apps. 
I can categorize it if I wanted to just say like all entertainment apps only they can only use that for so many hours or minutes in a day or I can be very specific to individual apps so I can go in there and I can adjust all of those different settings the other thing I can do is I can control who can contact them during downtime so if you're worried about your kids messaging their friends I can actually go in and I can say who is allowed to communicate with them during downtime, but I can make it to where you can't text or call just friends during the school day if I, if I wanted to. I am not particularly strict on who they can message during the day. Most of their close friends also homeschool. And as long as the work is getting done, I'm okay if they're taking a minute and messaging a friend, but it's very easy to tell if they're not. Another great feature with the screen time controls is that I can look at their activity log. So I can look at how many times they picked up their phone and what was the first app they looked at when they picked up their phone. So did they pick up their phone and go to text messaging? Did they pick up their phone and go to YouTube? Did they pick it up and turn on their music? And I can see how much time was spent on different apps. I can even see websites that they visited on their phone. So it gives you as the parent a lot of control. I know that Android devices, I believe there is something called like Google Family that does something similar for those devices, but we've never had Android phones, so I couldn't tell you specifically how that works. But whichever type of phone that your student has, I would look into what kind of controls you can put into there. That's just some of the ways that I take care of that. And I do reevaluate it from time to time. Like we're at the point at the end of the school year where they're getting done far earlier in the day than before because we're finishing off subjects and that's shortening our day. Or our schedules just get a little wonky where if, like we have a nice day and they really need to get out and get some golf practice in, for example, while the weather's nice. They might go and do that and then come back and be doing school at a different time during the day. And so I'll adjust the downtime hours from day to day, but it's pretty quick and easy for me to do from my phone. Um, this kind of is answering this, the next question as well. It says, how do you help your kids learn to manage time on them and apps as well as how much do you restrict? So that's really what I do is I determine how many hours they're gonna get on things and then I adjust it as the season changes and our schedules changes and also as they're they're getting older they they each got a phone several years ago when we got to a point where they would start being home by themselves because we don't have a, a landline anymore so i needed a way to get in touch with them uh, if i was away from the home and they were staying home alone their downtime hours were obviously much longer they their phones shut off much earlier in the evenings. They turned on much later in the day. There were a lot more restrictions on there. But as they're getting older, I'm giving them more and more freedom with that within reason. If I log on to their activity and I see something that I don't like, then they will lose those privileges. That either means phone taken away or you know, stronger restrictions on things or an app being deleted and not being allowed to reinstall it and things like that. So it is a matter of trust. They understand what they are and are not allowed to do and they understand the consequences if they don't follow those rules. Let's see, next one. There are so many great curriculum options out there. Tips on how to get over the mischievous fear of missing out. Well, this is a good one. This is a good one. Now, there's a lot of thoughts on this whole fear of missing out, but this question specifically talked about curriculum, so I'm not gonna talk about things like dances and socialization and all of that stuff. Let's talk specifically about curriculum. There are lots of great curriculum programs out there. There are tons of versions of all of the different main core subjects, and then there are electives, like for days. There are so many great electives. I would start, if, you're, if your child is just getting ready to enter high school, I would start with just getting a rough outline done. If you go to my Buy Me A Coffee page, which is just linked down below, I have a free download in the shop tab that is a high school outline. And just start by writing in those basics. Math, science course, English course, history course, or if your state has any specific requirements, because I know some states do for homeschoolers where you might need to have a speech course or a government course or whatever. Go ahead and write those in first and then look at how heavy those different school years are. 
then you can kind of see what is a reasonable number of electives to add in. And that's going to vary based on your student. You might have a student who's like super gung ho and can handle a whole bunch of coursework. And you might have a student who really just needs to focus on those core classes. Adding in a bunch of extras would just overwhelm them. I mean, you have to, you have to look at your individual student and decide what's going to be the best approach. We've always had some electives that I've chosen for them. I mean, they knew right off the bat, like they were going to have to do a foreign language. And we, we did German because that's our family heritage and that's the language that I can speak so I could teach it. Um, and they, we always do a Bible study or some sort of apologetics type course. Like those are ones I chose for them. But oftentimes I would just give them some options. I might tell them of a couple that I've heard about. I had a kind of an idea list that I had writ written out years ago where I just wrote down every different type of elective that I could think of. Everything from photography to drawing to philosophy to psychology, weightlifting, just a bunch of different ones. And I would show that to them and be like, does any of this sound interesting to you? And they pick one and I'd say, okay, we'll plug that one in and, and do it. As they've gotten older though, especially in that junior senior year range, uh, so largely with my daughter for next year and what my son is doing uh, his upcoming junior year, they've started to think about what it is they'd like to do as a career. And that has led me to try to help them choose electives that are a little more tailored to those future career goals. A uh, little spoiler alert on my curriculum choice videos that are coming out. My son has expressed interest in going to trade school and pursuing becoming an electrician like my stepdad is. And I think that's great. And I found an elective course that is on teaching basics of electronics. And I had a really good talk with the, the gentleman who owns that company and created that curriculum at the recent homeschool convention. And I purchased that elective for my son after I called him on the phone and I was talking to him about it. And I said, do you think this would be helpful in getting you prepared for the career path you want to you want to go on? And he said, yeah. And so that's what we're going to do. My daughter is going to be going into uh, athletic training and uh, possibly like nutrition kind of focus. So her electives going into her senior year are going to be ones that are either going to be required courses for her degree or things that are going to help her with some of her core courses that she's going to have when she goes to college. So that would be what I would do is just start by writing in those basics, maybe make yourself like an ideal list of electives and let your kids help you pick. Um, they will, they will probably find things that kind of fit their interest and you can give them some guidance. If a big long list overwhelms them, maybe narrow it down and be like, okay, out of these five, which one or two interest you the most? And then just look at it from semester to semester or year to year, what uh, your kids think. It is easy to kind of get into that, that mindset of like, I need to add in all of the things, you know, there's all of these little like unit studies and stuff like that, that are really cool. And you can introduce some of that stuff from time to time. It just gets harder when they get older because their core courses are a lot harder and there's a lot more material to learn. And I find that the more I try to add in all of those little extra things, the more it just overwhelms my kids. And so we have been over time kind of paring down all of those little, little things that in my mind I was like, oh, this will be great. But if your child is overwhelmed and if you as the homeschool parent are feeling overwhelmed, then as, as great as that little mini unit or whatever sounds, it's just, it's, it's not worth the mental stress it's putting on my kids and I. Next one, oh, this is a long one. Okay, it says, I know you do a lot of prep work getting ready for your guest hello curriculum. I saw on a video you set up a bookmark bar for your kids to click and go. Could you show these detailed stages you do for prepping and setting up guest hello? I, I didn't see how you set it all up. I'm going to be a first time user this fall and I'm a little overwhelmed. Um, and then she's got another part to her question. We'll get to that. I, the closest I have to what you're looking for, if you go to my guest hello playlist, I have a video 
that is on how I lesson planned for chemistry in the kitchen. Uh, I, I took one week's worth of that schedule and I showed what I did for that. Now, going into the summer, I get my curriculum select, selected really early and I start prepping it rather early in the summer as well. Um, I'll probably start it ev even as early as, as June and I will post some videos. So I will definitely be sure to show kind of how I'm setting up the curriculum specifically that we're gonna be using in the fall to try to highlight that a little bit better. So um, be sure to watch for that. I will, I've definitely uh, got plans to do that because uh, those courses do take a little bit of a unique approach and I, I totally get it. The first time I did one of those courses, I felt a bit overwhelmed simply because there's so many different options and I wanted to do all of the things. I felt like, again, fear of missing out. I thought my kids were gonna miss out if I didn't do every single thing on that schedule. And I very quickly realized that that was, it would be too much to try to do everything on this schedule. So I will do a video specifically on that, but if you'd like to get kind of a, a little idea on how that works, check out that lesson planning for chemistry in the kitchen. Uh, the second part of your question has to do with co-ops. Uh, it says co-op season is upon us. We're gearing up for classes next year. Do you have creative ideas for co-op classes? I work full time, find it a struggle to add additional work of creating and prepping co-op classes. Well, I've never taught co-op classes, but my kids have attended some. I think the first thing to look at is what type of age group are you gonna be working with? It will be very different if you're teaching younger kids or if you're teaching middle grade or high school students in terms of what types of co-op classes you want to do and how in depth you wanna get with the types of things you're teaching. So start with that. Now, if you're doing a mixed age group, so you've got a little bit of youngers and a little bit of olders, that can definitely be a little more of a challenge. And there are certain things that might work a little better in that case. One of the easiest courses I think to teach is nature study. I think that is a fantastic course that teaches kids good observation skills. It teaches them to appreciate nature and it's easily adaptable to lots of different age groups. It can be as simple as starting off by making sure each kid has some sort of a notebook, pencils, and possibly some drawing tools. So colored pencils or pens or something like that. And you can take them out and start by teaching them those basic principles of nature, nature study, where you look at things and you ask yourself, you know, you find one thing you're really interested in that day and you ask yourself, what is it I notice about it? What does it remind me of? And what do I wonder about it? And you can teach skills in little bits and pieces, how to take measurements, how to draw comparisons, and doing the research afterwards to find more out about that thing they're interested in. One website that's really awesome if you do nature study is called Raising Up Wild Things. Um, I'll try to link her website down below. All the way up through middle school, I was buying her downloadable nature study packets. They're beautiful. PDF packets on lots of different nature topics, pond studies. There were seasonal studies. So for, you know, fall, spring, and winter, um, there were studies on trees, bees, butterflies, uh, forests. I mean, just lots of different specific types of nature studies. There were even ones talking about the moon. So you could do these topical studies and maybe focus on that for a month or two months in your co-op. They have activities listed in there, so really easy to prep activities. They have worksheets that you can copy. There are beautiful illustrations that your students can look at, and there's tons of ideas on things like books you can get at the library or websites and videos you can check out to just really round out that nature study. I think that's one of the easiest ones. Um, art related ones are another easy one to teach. One of my daughter's favorite co-op classes she did what was a mini art class. So each week they created a little four by four canvas, but they were taught different painting skills or different techniques. And so they created a little canvas each week learning those different techniques. And so she had a collection of like, I don't know, eight paintings at the end. And it was, it was a lot of fun. It was um, one of those kind of low stress co-op classes, but she quite enjoyed it. Uh, my son took a logic class at the co-op and I believe it was the master book logic course. 
I hope that's the right company, but it's the, the one I'll put a picture up here. It's the one with the head and the thinking and on the cover. Um, and that instructor taught it right from the teacher manual. But there are a lot of other options you can do. Um, a drama type course would be a great one for different ages. You could uh, teach basics of how to set a stage, how to read a script, read stage directions, projecting your voice, um, and maybe even putting on like over the course of that semester, putting on a little production. Speech classes are so great to do in a co-op setting with your older students teaching good speaking skills and getting to practice in front of an audience. That is something that I always thought would just be hard to do just in the home. I think my kids would feel more awkward having to sit and give a speech to me and <laughs> their sibling than they would to actually talk to a class of students. So that could be another option as well. But I would just start with looking at the age group that you're that you're going to be working with and then where do your interests lie because if it's not something that you're really interested in then you won't you won't feel passionate about teaching it and then if you don't have time to do a lot of prep work consider something that's very easy to get started so like a speech course where you know you really just need like a teacher manual for it or a nature study course where you can get some of these PDFs and these notebooks. So hopefully that gives you a couple of ideas. All right, next question says, some days are better than others, but how do you monitor to make sure your kids are truly doing all the reading that goes along with subjects? I have four kids and I can't read everything they're reading, so I just trust that they are, that they do it. So this is probably referencing the fact that in a lot of my videos, I talk about the pre-reading that I do. My kids are in a lot of literature heavy courses. And so I do try to read the things that I'm going to assign them. And I spend quite a bit of my free time in the summer reading ahead when I'm going to be assigning the school year. But I totally understand that that can be really hard to do, especially if you have a lot of kids. So how do you make sure that they're doing their reading? Well, one, just direct observation. If you're in whatever room your kids are doing their homeschool work in, looking and checking that they're pulling out books and reading. That's one way to do it. If you're talking about something like a novel that they're supposed to be reading, I would assume that either there's some, it's either going with a literature course where there might be questions they need to answer or like a reading quiz that they need to do. But if it's reading to go along with say, like a history course or it's like a supplement for something. Um, I would one, at the very least, maybe get yourself a general idea of what the book is about. You know, take a quick look online to see what a summary is so you know the general plot or key things that are being talked about in the story. Um, that way, if you haven't read the book, you at least kind of know what the book's sort of about. And you can do things like ask them questions. Uh, and that's that it would be how they complete that subject for the day they they might have done reading maybe done a worksheet or whatever but then you know ask them a question or two um, tell me five interesting things you learned from the chapter you read today or give me a quick synopsis of that chapter what are the key things that happened and see what they can what they can tell you and make that a part of that assignment that they they have to give you that summary to be done with that subject for the day another thing you can do which is one that i really like to have is narrow narration journal so for our literature based courses so for my son's history course and my daughter's government econ course they have a notebook and i will actually write in prompts for them and i'll look at what kind of things were assigned that week and those prompts will go along with that. Sometimes it's a very specific question, um, like how did this, oh gosh, let me think of a good example. When my son learned about like the, the, the black death in medieval times, I, I had a question there like, based on what you learned this week, how did this impact something like the, the, like the course of society. It was, I don't know, I can't remember the exact wording, but I looked at the topic he was studying that week and I came up with a question that would tell me if he had 
really done those reading assignments and really absorbed it. And I expected him to write a full page in his narration journal summarizing that for me. That was a grade for him filling that out in his narration journal. Sometimes I, it's a little more vague where I'll say give me 10 interesting facts from the reading assignment for today and he has to list those out in the narration journal and that is a grade and that way I can look at that and if he can't answer that question from the reading that tells me he didn't do the reading and he needs to go back and do it so uh, doing just a quick verbal recap with them even if you haven't read it um, they should be able to speak fairly coherently about what it is they read or doing some sort of a narration journal. Um, my daughter did a very extensive narration journal last year with her botany course. She took all kinds of notes from all of her different reading assignments and she really got into it, adding sketches and diagrams and everything. And it was, it was beautiful. And that's the way that we tracked that she was doing all of the reading assignments for that. Um, but it can be hard because, um, you know, it, it is a lot to monitor, especially if you have four kids and they're all doing different things at different times. But um, if you get them in the habit of doing either like a written narration or basically an oral narration for you, they'll, they'll know to expect that and they're going to know that they're going to have to be able to speak to the things that they're writing. If it's a longer novel that they're doing, you could always do things like at the end of the novel require them to write like a one page book report or something like that on it. It doesn't have to be anything too fancy but just something to show that they've read it, that they understood the characters and the plot and the key elements of it and things like that. So um, that is a couple of ideas for you there. Um, do we do all subjects every day or do we use, do we use block scheduling? Most subjects are done every day. There are a few that are done a little bit differently. Um, my son's nutrition course, he only does on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. My daughter, a lot of her courses are ones where she gets an assignment at the start of the week that she's supposed to work on over the course of the whole week. And she sort of picks and chooses how much time she spends on that each day. So for her, like her literature, She'll have a goal for the week, what she's supposed to read or what she's supposed to write. And she has all the way till Friday to get it done. Philosophy, same thing. She'll have a chapter to read and homework questions. They're due on Friday. And a lot of times she'll get a ton of that done on Monday because she wants to lighten her load the rest of the week. When they were in middle school and kind of like the fifth, sixth grade range, we did a little more of the block scheduling with things like health and geography where we would kind of rotate like one of them would be on Tuesday Thursdays and the other would be Monday Wednesday Friday but we've always done the core subjects pretty much every day so they always did science they always did history they always did math they always did English so those four big areas were always every day let's see could we do government and econ one year and personal finance the next year does it break it up to be able to do that can I give a full credit for personal finance and can I add a literature credit Oh my gosh, there's like 10 questions in this one. Okay, <laughs> I'm not gonna, I won't read all of them. I'm gonna address a couple. This is referencing the Guest Hollow Government Econ Personal Finance course. It's a combination literature-based course from Guest Hollow that my 11th grader is doing and which I will definitely have my son do at some point before he graduates. As the name suggests, it does cover a lot of different things. So the, to answer the first part of your question, can you do Government Econ one year and Personal Finance the yes? the the next yes I think you totally could when you look at the schedule it's pretty easy to tell which books and which videos and assignments kind of go with each of those three subjects so I would just kind of go through and maybe highlight the ones that are personal finance so that way you know to skip those the one year and add those in the next but I will say that if you're looking to lighten your students load, I would split off government and econ versus splitting off personal finance. Personal finance has the lightest workload of those three subjects. So if you're concerned about just how much work or reading your students doing, you'll lighten it a lot more by maybe doing government one year and then doing econ and personal finance together another year or doing government, personal finance and econ another year. 
And that's just looking at the overall reading load for everything. But yes, you can break it up. Um, can you give a full credit? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I am giving her a full year credit for government, a full year credit for econ, a full year credit in personal finance. And I'm also giving her a half credit in logic because there's a ton of logic stuff that's incorporated in this course, specific books and videos. For a literature credit, because there are so many books, you probably could. There are, in this course, there are a couple of fiction books that are included that they, they recommend because of they basically highlight what happens when government goes wrong. The Hunger Games is included, Animal Farm, uh, 1984. We, we did not read those this year because she's actually read all of those in previous years, but those are easy books to find online novel studies for. So you could have them read that as a part of the course, but then maybe do kind of the literature side of things like some book analysis and a paper and things like that and totally do a literature credit. There's there's tons of reading. There's some fantastic nonfiction books as well. And I think it's just as important to be able to evaluate nonfiction books as it is to you know do literary analysis of of fiction ones. Have you done a video where you've shown a lesson from geography and cultures through Guest Hollow? Um, like a solo video just on one of those lessons, I don't think I have. I have a video introducing geography and cultures in my Guest Hollow playlist. And I think in a couple of Day in the Life videos, not from this past year, but from the year before, I probably showed a little bit more about that course. Um, that was one that my son did his freshman year. And so I, I can't really go back and like lesson prep for that, but check out some of the day in the lives from that year and that intro video in the guest hollow playlist. Okay. If you're comfortable, would you mind sharing the changes you made to your eating to reduce cholesterol? In a goals video recently, I talked about getting lab work done and how um, I really watch all of my numbers. You know, obviously as a nurse, I know what all of these different labs mean and I know how different things will impact my health and my health risk for things, but my cholesterol has been really great. About, oh gosh, it's been a while now, five, six years ago, I was rather overweight and I was having a lot of joint pain and just really unsatisfied with where I was at with things. I had gone through a lot of cycles, you know, I would like diet and exercise hard and I'd lose a bunch of weight and then I'd gain it all back and Ugh, I was just really unhappy and I wanted to find a way to really improve my health and a lot of traditional diets just weren't doing me any good. I was also working a whole bunch at the time and I wasn't on a good exercise routine. At that time, I actually did about 18 months of very strict keto dieting. Now, I'm not here to promote that and say like that's the way to go. I did a ton of research and I talked to my doctor before I did it. And anytime you're gonna do a big diet change, I always recommend you talk to your doctor because there are some things that are safer for some people than others. Uh, so keto dieting is where you severely limit the amount of carbohydrates that you're taking in. You instead shift to getting the majority of your calories from good fat sources. So I'm not talking about sitting there and frying up bacon all day and eating that but learning what types of foods can provide a good source of, of fat. So avocados and I was, I would, I would do like eggs and different types of meats and things like that. I could eat plenty of vegetables. So I ate tons of salads, broccoli and cauliflower and all of that, but I stayed away from real starchy vegetables. So I wasn't eating potatoes. I wasn't eating corn. Um, and I, went through what they call kind of the keto flu because what happens is your body has to learn to not go for the sugars for energy instead to work on breaking down fats and you feel like garbage for about two weeks and then your body gets used to it and you feel a lot better. Uh, I lost about 90 pounds in six months. I mean it was extremely dramatic like the amount that I that I lost 
with that diet change and I got to a point where I was comfortable with where I was at. I was feeling really good. And then I worked on doing a transition to something that was more maintainable because it, it was hard to be on such a drastically different diet than the rest of my family. Every time I made something for dinner for them, I had to make something different for myself. I had to be very conscious of what was in different things I was buying from the store. Even something as simple as getting a protein bar. Like there are protein bars that are packed full of sugars and carbs. And then there are those that are not. Like I had to really be mindful of all of that. And you would think with doing a diet that was high in fats that my cholesterol would have gone through the roof. And I, in fact, was super curious on that. I mean, I was losing the weight. I was feeling really good. And so I asked my doctor, I said, can I get labs done? And when you look at cholesterol, you have a total cholesterol count, but it's looking at your HDL and your LDL. So your good cholesterol and bad cholesterols. My good cholesterol was very high and my bad cholesterol was abnormally low. Like she's, she's looking at that. She goes, so if you look at your total cholesterol, she goes, it looks just above normal. She goes, but your bad cholesterol is so incredibly low. She goes, I have no concerns about you having heart disease pretty much ever. And when I kind of went into more of a, a maintenance diet, so I do a lot of protein now and still a lot of vegetables and I watch the carbs and I increased my activity level. So I, I trying to work out, I lift weights and obviously I kind of live um, out in the country. So I'm doing tons of stuff outside while I am not, you know, I'm never going to be model thin. I've, I've had kids and genetics and all that jazz, like, and that's fine. I don't want to be that. I just want to be happy and feel good. Uh, so, and I, and I do, I feel good and I can do the things I want to do. Uh, so my labs have maintained those levels. Everything is looking really good, but that was the big change I did. But again, I'm not saying you should go out and do that unless you talk to your doctor and make sure that it's something that is going to be safe for you and that you do your research before you do it. There are a lot of different diets out there and I don't, I don't want to sit there and say that I'm going to promote one or the other, but since you asked, that is specifically what I did. Where do you buy seeds and bulbs? I do a ton of gardening. Color Blends is my go-to website for bulbs. They have a beautiful selection, but you do need to order early. I would put in a bulb order in June or July, and then they will ship them to you about the time they're supposed to be planted. Phenomenal success with their bulbs. Like my tulip show this year was amazing, amazing. And then seeds, my favorite place to buy seeds is Johnny Seeds. Um, it, I'll link their website down below. They have a huge variety of everything from vegetables to different types of perennials to annual flowers, herbs, all kinds of stuff. And in lots of different quantities. So if you want to get a small pack of seed or if you want to get a huge pack of seeds, they also sell seed potatoes, bare root strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, all of that stuff. I like their seeds because one, they're tested pretty regularly for germination rates and that's on the package. They also have a ton of information on their packages, so much more than I see on pretty much any other brand's package. Information on how to plant it, whether it should be direct sown or whether it should be transplanted, how soon to start it, how far to bury it, whether it should have vermiculite, does it need light to germinate, darkness to germinate, how far apart to space them, how big to expect them to grow, what kind of pH soil does it need? everything you need to have. So that's my favorite place to get seeds. This year I did also get um, a couple of seed varieties that Johnny's didn't carry. I got them from Swallowtail. And while I really like the varieties and I'm looking forward to see how they do in the garden, I will say the germination rate, so that's how many of the seeds actually produced a plant, um, was far lower than any of my Johnny seed varieties. But I am interested to see how the ones that did get up to the seedling stage and that have been transplanted out to the garden ultimately do. Um, biggest fears with your kids becoming teenagers, um, other drivers, <laughs> there, there's a bunch. Actually, this question could be like a whole video. In fact, I'm going to start it because I think that's a great topic to talk about in more detail, but my daughter has her license. My son is going to be getting his at the end of the summer and they are good drivers. I am terrified of the other people on the road, especially just 
working in the field that I work in and seeing far too many car accident victims and taking care of far too many car accident victims, it terrifies me. People who drive fast and don't follow road rules and get road rage and all of that. All right, and I am over my self-imposed time limit. So even though I do have some questions left, I'm gonna end the video there and I will save the ones I haven't answered for a future Q&A video. And for sure, I will do a video talking more about kind of those fears with the kids becoming teenagers because I think a lot of us probably have very similar fears and concerns, but there are some great ways that we can help ourselves be emotionally and mentally prepared to to be parenting teenagers so i think that'll be a great topic for a future video i will try to link videos that i mentioned or websites that i mentioned down below in the description box for you so you can check those out and if you have any follow-up questions or a question that wasn't answered please feel free to drop a comment i will add them on to my list and save them for the next q a video thanks for joining me today everybody i'll see you in the next one happy homeschooling mm -hmm.